Good morning, my dear friends. Good morning, my dear friends. Good morning, McKenna. Morning. Logan, Evan, Goostries, good to see you. Josh and Jetty. Hey, Mr. C. Possibly just Josh's iPad. I don't know. Maybe not Josh. I know his iPad logs in without him if he's late. Mr. C. Sir. So I was, I remembered that I was supposed to do something for homework this week. So I just did it this morning. So I picked um, Franz Joseph. So he wasn't taken as far as I could see, so. Cool. Yeah, we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about that uh, stuff here in just a second. I'm, uh, well, I'm glad you remembered. I actually have a, uh, well, I'll explain that here in just a minute when I get everybody out. We got, we're only about 15. We got another five or six people to get here. Oh, good. Smeagol is in. That's good. Good morning, Smeagol. You'll be happy to know that I'm not wearing the precious today. I have a different ring on. It doesn't mean that I don't have the precious. It just means that I'm not wearing the precious. Can you see Liam? Hold on a minute. You have your video off today because you feel awful. Oh, that's okay. You're perfectly welcome to either do it or not do it. Where is Lamb? Oh, there you go. Yes, I can. While we're waiting for everybody to join us here. Oh. There's another McKenna. We had a McKenna a minute ago, and now we have a different McKenna. Or maybe it's the same McKenna, but it's actually Morgan. Uh, so as you may notice from the background here, I'm not in my usual digs at my house. I'm actually at a cabin way up in the mountains because technically I'm on vacation but I love you so much that I'm willing to like blow off my family and my children and my grandchildren for an hour or so and come and talk to you instead. Yay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, More fun uh, anyway. Wow. Rough morning. Emma. Emma Cooper. Is it snowing there where you guys are? It's not snowing. It rained last night, though. Oh. It snowed where I am. Also, nice. also, there's a raccoon loose in the uh, cabin. We don't really know where he's gone. We spent several hours yesterday trying to catch him. Here, raccoons are better than we are at this stuff, apparently. Uh, I'm going to walk you around the uh, this ridiculous cat. Is it inside the cabin? Oh, uh, yeah. So we have um, a lot of people in my family, and we're all gathered here for our uh, for this reunion here. So I'm going to I'm going to walk you through the gigantic 3,000 square foot cabin we're in. That's the pool down there. Yes, we have a pool inside. Breakfast. Here's a bunch of people. Say hi, Gwen. That's Gwen. Oh, well, there's Maxwell. Cool. We have um, some snow. Beautiful views here as well. It's a pretty awesome place, I have to say. Oh, here. This is like the best view. Back over here. Pretty awesome. Um, 
Yeah, I'm up up in the mountains of, of Utah. So um, a couple things about how class is going to work today. Number one, here's everybody with breakfast. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Most of those are my kids. Oh, there are the Mighty Becks. Cool. Uh, the pool table over here. Just, just a quick tour of the place here. It's incredible. This place is unbelievable. Oh, that's chipmunk. Or is it a mouse? Chipmunk. Not, not a raccoon. So, not inside. The chipmunk was outside. Although yesterday while we were watching the baseball game, a mouse came running around to just check the score, I guess. So. Yes, that is a bounce house inside the cabin. That yeah. is the coolest is thing great. ever. One of these days when I'm super rich because I wrote a best-selling novel and everybody read it and they thought it was great. <laughs> I'm going to rent this place out and everybody's coming here and we're going to do class here for a weekend. Yeah, that's up. Sound good? Everybody in on that? Cool. That'll be good. I'll send the fun bus to pick y'all up and uh, transport you. Where am I going to do this? Who would be smart to do this? So, um, um, as you can tell from the from the local digs here, um, uh, it's a little bit different um, procedure today. There's Alex, cool. Here we go. We got everybody now, pretty much. Um, we. Uh, <laughs> When I packed to come here, oh, what did I do with my, oh, I gotta get my book. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I remembered to bring my computer, I remembered to bring all the chargers, I remembered to bring much of the um, stuff, where do I put that, that I need. But I forgot to bring um, my list of who's doing what and many of my notes for 1915. So I'm gonna have to ask for your help today. Um, it is fun, we're having an absolutely amazing time. Um, but I'm gonna have to ask for your help today. So you guys are gonna have to dig into 1915 and find out all the stuff that happened and tell me what it is because my notes on 1915 are on my computer at home. Nice to see. Yep. Where are you guys at? We're up in the mountains above Heber in Utah. Um, Heber's about 20 minutes ride down the... Um, no, not on Utah. Down the hill. Uh, yeah, it is probably really expensive. Fortunately, my mother saves money like crazy. This place, let's see, how much would this place be per night? A thousand bucks, probably. Is it a hotel? Or what? Probably, probably neighborhood of a thousand bucks. So not like, yeah, so not like super cheap at all. But then... For breakfast this morning, we had 60 of us. <coughs> so, you know, you kind of need some, you know, some space. Yeah. So that's why I say when I, when I um, have a best-selling novel and I have lots and lots of money, then I'll just come get you and bring you all down here and we can have a big class down here at the cabin. Heck, I'll bring in all the kids from the other homeschool co-ops and we'll have giant homeschool co-op awesomeness here at this, uh, at this awesome place. Ideally when it's not snowing, although who knows. It wasn't really supposed to snow, but it just is like, yeah, right? Field trip, doesn't that sound good? We could do a simulation all day. 
we could totally do that. I'm, I'm wholly in favor. I think it, it, all in favor say aye. Okay, cool. Aye. Any opposed? Do I, do I hear any opposition? No. McKenna's like, no, I don't like you that much. So you don't have to come. It's cool. No, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try something here for just a second. Bear with me. Those of you who have things to present um, to the group, um, almost all day. Yeah, that would be, that would be awesome. You might have to get out one of the one of the diplomacy variants that has like twenty players. There's Abby. Yay, Abby's here. Um, if you have something to present, will you put that in the chat while I'm rigging up my gear here so that I can actually see your bright smiling faces instead of cramming you all onto my tiny little screen. McKenna says she has no opposition. Well then, the rest of us are relieved indeed. Because really it's all about McKenna. I mean, yeah. Tanner, Jordan, and at 24 participants, we have now broken the record for a number of participants in our class. Boom. All right. Uh, not that. This thing over here, how about this? No, I don't want that. And this thing. <clears throat> Last time it took four hours, yes. If you had 20 players, it takes like a month. It's incredible. So, yeah, you could easily play all day. The, uh, the first uh, time. What? I have just found a complete timeline of World War I, 1915 events. Woohoo! Okay, Jetty's driving this bus today. <clears throat> that sounds good because I don't, I, I, I have a couple things I know I want to mention, but um, other than that, really, I'm going to kind of depend on you guys to tell me what we should be talking about. Also, class will probably end a little bit early. I am supposed to do a class for my little nieces and nephews uh, sometime here this morning. So, um, just kind of going to be a little bit of a weird day today. And I appreciate you being patient with all this. It was either this or don't do class at all, and I couldn't actually bring myself at all. Let's see. Source. Where's my source here? Input. Let's try that. HDMI. Which one is that going to be? Three? No? Two. Hey, what's this about? <laughs> what's this about? What? Sorry, you broke up. What's this about presenting today? Oh, not everybody had something that they, because a lot of people had reports and stuff that they did last for last week. So not everybody had one of those. Um, but if there were a couple people that we didn't get to last week, and so I wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to, if they wanted to talk about their historical character, or if they wanted to tell the class about their, their dehumanization papers. Like I got a couple really good ones um, about dehumanization if you wanted to talk about that as well. So um, it's not everybody. Um, I just had a little bit more research to do okay I had a little you bit more research here. i'm going to send you the email to... that sounds almost great. almost 20 minutes into the class and we've learned all about mr c's cabin can you believe it have you ever learned so many interesting facts about that cabin in such a small amount of time i bet you haven't
Yeah, what, what the assignments are. Yeah, I wanted to hear from you about uh, how, how we use dehumanization to demonize each other, et cetera. And that is perfectly okay. Whatever you have notes on, that's, that's great. You're in charge of your own education here. Yes, it worked. Okay, cool. First of all, we're <laughs> 18 minutes in. Second of all, we just barely got most of our people here. So I don't feel too bad about it, honestly. I think we're, we're doing okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about 1915. Yeah, it won't be on the test. Yeah, have I mentioned I don't like, I don't do tests? I think well, I, someone's I, celebrating in the chat. I think I've probably mentioned that I don't do tests and I don't give grades. Unless they make me. I do have a couple schools I teach at where they make me give grades and so then I give grades, but. Yes, I imagine you saw Eliza's Hedgehog Apparently, Eliza's Hedgehog is a major star now at the back household. And she named it, I forget, you know, Wilhelmina or something. I forget what it was. <laughs> no, it's Sammy. Sammy. What? Sammy's Sammy? Oh, come on. It's a hedgehog. <laughs> what, should, I, should I make him hedgy? <laughs> Head, oh, come on, you got a better imagination than that. It's not like it's going to answer to it anyway, so you can call it whatever you want. No, don't even you named it Mr. C. Oh, I am not that prickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe I can't remember. Okay, so I don't want to know. Don't answer that. Do not argue with me on that subject. Okay. Uh, all right, so, wow, 10 new messages. Hold on, I'm gonna catch up on the chat here. Come on, Mr. Okay. C, you're falling behind. Frodo, that's awesome. That would be good. It, as I say, it's not like it's going to, like, answer when you call it, so pretty much name it anything you decide uh, you want to. All right, so um, let's start with 1915, and then we'll sort of work our way around. Actually, um, I think the first, um, uh, I think the first thing is Evan. Evan wanted to talk about Franz, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria. So why don't we start with Evan, and then we're going to work our way through 1915. For those of you who are, who really seriously want to talk about something today, dig into 1915 and find interesting facts, because like I say, my notes are actually at my computer at home. So you guys are going to have to drive this, okay? So. Evan, go ahead, and uh, oh, he already put it in the chat. Look at that. Franz Joseph takes over from, I think, Maria Teresa. I could be wrong about that. And then his wife got murdered? Whoa. I didn't know that. Now I'm gonna have to look that up. And Emma Cooper is, I think, out of the car now and at home. Emma's back. Okay, cool. Um, well, he was in a war. Yeah, but is, it, is that really a murder? I was thinking about this on the first, on the very first of January in 1915, something terrible happens to the British Navy. Anybody know what that is? This one I remember because it was New Year's Day. You wrote something on von Hindenburg? Oh, I want to hear about Paul von Hindenburg. We'll talk about him in a minute though, McKenna. Don't let me forget. Okay, so on the first of January, New Year's Day, 1915, there's a terrible tragedy that happens to the British Navy. Anybody know what it was? Anybody want to look it up and see what it was and tell me what it was? You can do this. You have the capabilities. I know it. Give me one second. The 
great one in January. 1915. Today we're going to talk mostly about 1915. So you can confine yourself mostly there. We're going to range a little bit, but mostly about 1915. The Americans shot the Navy with cannons. No, the Americans are not in the war yet. Some will, but they kind of are, which I will tell you about in a minute, but not right now. January 1st. HMS sunk by German submarine in the English Channel. The HMS Formidable, which apparently was not very, was uh, no, the, by a German submarine. More than 500 people died. At the same time, somebody put up the, um, the Broken Hill, um, yeah, the Broken Hill train robbery. Uh, this happens in, where is Broken Hill, McKenna? Also on the 1st of January, Broken Hill train robbery. I've just found a much more detailed timeline of 1915. Cool. I like it. Chat box got weird. Well, yeah. But that's what we're talking about in this class is World War I so, and World War II when we get to that. So that's what we get to talk about. Um, where is Broken Hill? Time to use your resources, people. Let those fingers fly. I know you're capable of doing I it. I read about Broken Wales. Hill and Foot. Broken Hill's Australia. Correct. Yeah. Um, allegedly a couple of um, bandits in support of the Ottoman Empire uh, attacked a train in Broken Hill, Australia, and a bunch of people were killed, including the guys who took over the, took over the train. I really can't believe, like seriously, they're dead, so you, we can't ask them. But seriously, the Ottoman Empire? Do you know how far away the Ottoman Empire is from Australia? If you don't, you should. It's a long, 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 long way. Yakawina County. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, like how and how are two guys in support of the Aust of the Ottoman Empire? going to do anything valuable in a mining town in Australia. But the point is, this isn't local war two. This isn't European war two. This is world war two, right? You could destroy some resources. Yeah, I guess. But man, Australia is A, not a major player in the war. And B, that's a heck of a long way away. Well, but the thing is, because it's a world war, pretty much everybody is involved or pretty much every area is involved. During 1915, you have combat taking place in Africa, South America, Mexico, um, on, the, on the continent, obviously, uh, on the island of Britain. You have conflict going on in between China and Japan. You have this attack uh, happening in Australia. So really, the entire world is involved in some way or the other in what's going on with this war. But it's not the only thing that's happening. But it's one of the major, obviously, the, you know, the world war is a, is a major thing. And one of the reasons we call it a world war is because pretty much every corner of the world is involved in what's happening, with one really kind of big exception. Which country is not really involved in the war? Is it America? Correct. Yeah, the United States is not involved in the war. Now, if you've ever had a World War I class before, they probably told you that the reason that the United States got involved in, um, got involved in World War I was because of a particular event. Does anybody remember what that event would be? I just want to kind of check knowledge. 
The train driver was a famous marksman. Cool. See, see, even these obscure events, you can learn all, no, that's World War II. Good call. Yep, you got it. You, you didn't need me to tell you that. That's World War II. Uh, not, a, not a problem. At least you were willing to guess. McKenna, now might be a really good time to talk about Paul von Hindenburg now. There you go. You going to tell us about Paul von Hindenburg? I think you're unmuted. Could be wrong, but I think you are. Let's see. Can I unmute you? I should be able to unmute you. I would unmute everybody except that then I would have to hear from Jetty again. I'm kidding, Jetty. Oh, wait a second. Yep. Yeah. Hello? Okay, that was weird. I was unmuted, but. Okay, now my Google Docs is floating. Okay, there we go. Um, okay. Paul Ludwig Hans Anton von Beckendorf und von Hindenburg was born on the 2nd of October, 1847 in Posen, Prussia. He was a German World War I military commander and the second president of the Weimar Republic from 1925 to 1933. The Weimar Republic was the government from 1919 to 1933. His presidential circumstances were made difficult with political insecurity, economic failure, and the rise of Adolf Hitler. Hindenburg was involved in the war at a very young age. He was a cadet at the young age of 11 years old. A cadet is a young war trainee. When he was about 19 years old, Paul fought in the Austro-Prussian War, which lasted for seven weeks. At about 23 years of age, he fought in the Franco-German War of 1870. This war lasted for one year. Quite a bit later, Sir Paul von Hindenburg retired in the year of 1911. However, Hindenburg was needed again in August of 1914 to be the formal superior of Major General Eric Ludendorff because the army claimed Ludendorff to be one of their best strategists he was chosen to lead a Russian invasion group from East Prussia. Hindenburg received the credit for Ludendorff's achievement. Shortly afterward, Hindenburg's status overshadowed that of Emperor William II. He was then promoted to a field marshal. In 1916, the emperor was persuaded to allow Hindenburg control over all German land forces with Ludendorff at his side. Because they were unable to win the war on land, the two decided to starve Britain into surrender by taking down ships that were delivering food to Britain. Hindenburg's submarine warfare triggered the United States' decision to enter the war. Germany was sinking American ships as well as plotting with Mexico to help them regain some of the U.S. territories. Finally, America entered the war in 1917, just one year before Germany's defeat in 1918. Paul von Hindenburg was very influential in Germany during World War I. Cool. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. So what was the, um, anybody but McKenna, what was the thing that Hindenburg did that uh, got the United States all riled up? There are submarines attacking not only the other ships, but also American trade ships. Very good. And why couldn't they do that? Like, why did Americans think that was nasty other than the Americans are getting sunk? It's just not fair. <laughs> are, are we involved in the war? No. Okay. Have you ever um, had a, a squabble going on in your house in which you were not involved 
and then all of a sudden it spilled over and started involving you like people crashing into you or stealing your stuff or yelling at you and you had nothing to do with it i'm sure that's never happened but even if it's never happened you can imagine it right well these are not necessarily warships that's right these are trade ships and all of a sudden they're sinking american ships now look look we're, i'm not going to talk a lot about this now because we're going to talk a lot more about this in 1917 but the truth is that if the united states is supplying arms ammunition food all kinds of stuff to an enemy of germany doesn't germany have to do something about that this is what the germans said the the big the big problem the ship that they sank that got everybody really upset does anybody remember what the name of that ship was it is not the titanic don't even try me wasn't it called the lusitania it was called the lusitania give the girl a gold star that's correct it was called the lusitania look up when the lusitania was sunk the titanic thank you sabrina dragon rider sheesh elizabeth my gosh i told you not titanic <laughs> yeah i do too keep it up huh may 7 may 7 1920 um 15. 1915 the united states gets involved in the war when what year 1915 no no 1917. so when i went to school everybody told me the reason the United States got involved in the war was because of the sinking of the Lusitania. It's a passenger liner, like a luxury passenger liner. Then the German German U-boat sank it. And uh, it had a bunch of Americans on board. And so America got all mad and entered the war. Turns out, not so much. Yes, it's mean, it's passengers, yes, but. But. You need to look up what actually happened with the Lusitania. Yes, it's a passenger ship. Yeah, there are lots of, well, there's always passengers on the ship. No ship is sailing around the ocean without any passengers on it. Okay, it might just be captain and crew or whatever. But there are a lot of fairly weird things surrounding the sinking of the Lusitania. Plus, as it turns out, my history teacher lied to me because it definitely wasn't the Lusitania that got the United States involved in the war. The Lusitania sank two years before the United States got involved in the war. In World War II, somebody said Pearl Harbor earlier. It's Pearl Harbor that gets the United States involved in World War II. How long between the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war by the United States? How long was it? Twenty-four hours or so. Yeah. So that's when you say this thing leads directly to this thing. When it's two years, you're yeah, you're yeah, exactly, Elizabeth. You're not really convincing me at this point that that's why. Now it might be you know what what McKenna was saying, widespread submarine warfare, etc. Sooner or later, look, the United States was going to come in to the war. And which side was the United States definitely going to come in on? I mean, this is not even really a question, although there was a big argument. Yeah, they're going to come in on England's side. Why are they going to come in on England's side? On England's side? Because they're both victims. Where? Yeah, no, that's not, no. Because they speak like the same language, mostly. Um, essentially the same language. The British would argue <laughs> that we don't really speak the same language, but we like to claim them. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly a linguistic thing, honestly. Um, so you have a situation with, um, with the Lusitania where the Germans, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> wow, 
who um, who has the biggest navy in the world in 1915? Not now. That question, the answer to all military questions now is the U.S. But um, in, probably um, England, just because they're surrounded by. Yeah, right. I mean, if you played diplomacy, who had the biggest navy? England does. That's you just do. Okay. Yeah. Right, they're surrounded by water. So England has the biggest navy, but Germany has a particular naval advantage in a particular kind of naval combat. What kind of combat is that? Submarines. Aha! Yeah. Germans are especially good at submarine combat, and the Germans have more submarines than anybody else. So the Germans start using their submarines to attack English shipping, it seems reasonable. The first, well, not the first one, they were doing it early, early in the war, but the biggest one was when they sank the, um, the formidable on the 1st of January, 1915. Lost with all hands, uh, 800 or 500 and some odd uh, And this really made the British incredibly, like they were furious about this think about it for a second and see if you can think why the british would have been so mad about that i mean other than a bunch of people are dead which like duh what was it about that do you think that made them so angry Yes, well, kind of. The monitor is not really a submarine, but it's kind of a submarine. I got to move my gear here, sorry. So I can still see you. But it's kind of a submarine. Okay, they sank one of their best ships, sure. Bunch of people die. Yeah, okay. But think about it, okay? So the British Navy is the pride of their is the pride of Britain, right? They have all these, but what do they mostly have in terms of what are their warships? What do they look like? What kind of ships are they? Are they submarines or are they service ships? Definitely service ships. Yeah, they're service ships. And they love these, right? I mean, this has been a big deal, right? And all of a sudden their surface ships start sinking. Is this fair? Does this feel fair to you if you're British? No, you're sailing along along on the, on the water the way you're supposed to do on top of the water. And all of a sudden your ship gives a big hole blown in the side and everybody starts to drown. What does that feel like? Does that feel fair? I mean, nothing it, feels fair in warfare. Right, all fair in love and war, right? Well, I don't know about. Yep. I don't know about love, but anyway, um, all fair in war, right? Except that it doesn't feel fair. The British keep are, feel like the Germans are sneak attacking them. Like this is not fair. They shouldn't be able to do this. So, it's in a war. It's a war. You're supposed to blow stuff up. That's kind of the point, right? And yet the British are freaking out because the way the Germans are going about fighting the war. And look, if you're the Germans, it's not like you've got a lot of choices. You can't deal with the British Navy on top of the way. They're, they just have way too many ships. Your only chance is to attack them with submarines. But as soon as you do, the British get all furious. Not, I mean, so they're already mad. They're already fighting you in a war. <laughs> So the British freak out over this and send additional troops and they get really, start talking about war crimes and all kinds of funky things. Okay, additional events in 1915. Jetty, you said you had this huge detailed list. Pick something and tell us about it. I have one. I gotta grab, yeah, go ahead. I gotta grab a chair, keep going. It's one of the nastiest things in the war is the Battle of Yerps on the 
Western Front over in France, it was the first time that they introduced chemical warfare. It was on April 22nd, 1915. It was early. Sabrina, don't ugh me. <laughs> It was early in the morning, and they had perfect weather conditions, and they went and they released, I think it was like 15 tons of it. One moment. I think it was 15 tons, something like that. But they released a whole lot of this gas and just slowly drifted across no man's land, and it made it to the troops' side, to the French side. And basically what this chlorine gas would do is it'd just choke them to death and it would burn them. It's pretty nasty. They, this was the first time that they used it and it became a regular thing during tr uh, trench warfare for the Germans. That first initial attack, though, on the French, the chemical gases killed 6,000 troops on just that initial attack. Oh. I thought, maybe I'm wrong about this. I thought the first time anybody used chemical weapons in uh, World War One, it didn't work very well. Balamov, yeah. They shot 18,000 uh, gas shells, none of which worked. It was at the Russians. Ha ha. First I, time I, it worked, though, was in Europe's. It didn't work I because... Think. Mother Nature froze. It was too yeah. cold. Was too cold. Whenever you attack Russia, Mother Nature comes to the rescue. I don't think anybody's in there. I don't. I don't know. Bye. I love you too. Those are my daughters. Mother Nature's favorite child, Russia. Apparently. I mean, she only loves them during war. I've been there when there wasn't a war, and Mother Nature appears to have completely forgotten that country existed, except for winter. Like one during the years. war is when Mother Nature is apologizing for neglecting him ah. and giving him special attention. Ah, that's what it is. I knew it was something. Somewhere I have a pair of glasses, and I could actually see the screen. That would be cool. Well, there. all's quiet on the Western Front. Um, they use gas, and it kind of explains what it does. And since they didn't really have gas ma gas masks that really worked very well, if you pulled off your gas mask too early, you would die. But if you pulled it off too late, you would suffocate and set up your gas mask. So you had to get it just right, unless you wanted to die by deadly gas or die by suffocation. Yeah, um, talk a little bit about, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna talk too much about this because this is like the most gruesome and horrifying part of the entire war, um, in my opinion. But, but talk a little bit about what kind, like what does this gas do? It was well, it like, depends on which gas. Right. It was like the beginning of the foster gas or something. The stuff today we use to throw into foxholes and burn people out. Um, there's a couple of different, well, a lot of different kinds of gas. So those of you who watched your Wonder Woman, um, Wonder Woman is basically, I mean, the whole crux of the movie, right? Revolves around the development of this, uh, of this gas that gas masks can't um, filter out. But uh, the gas mask didn't do a great job of filtering that stuff out anyway, did it? Nope, not really. Not, not really. Um, so there's a couple different kinds of gas. I actually only have one very brief experience with what this is like. Uh, but I'm going to try to describe it to you. So my experience is with chlorine gas. Um, even the tiniest whiff of poison gas I'm going to have to and would bark so the soldiers would put their masks on Sergeant Stubby that's awesome 
I love that. Um, Sergeant Stubby, that's fantastic. Okay, so here's the deal. So um, I was, uh, this was not in war. I've not actually been in one, although I have been in a terrorist attack. Remind me to tell you about that. But, um, but I do have a very brief experience with um, chlorine gas. So I was in a room and a great deal of chlorine, it was a chemical reaction. It was a cleanser that was being used and it reacted with the, um, uh, with the stuff on the floor, with the particular kind of, um, some kind of mold on the floor and it reacted in a way that generated a whole bunch of chlorine gas. So we did, you can't see it. It's all, it's invisible. In all the movies, the gas, like the, the gas bomb goes up and you can see this like cloud, but that's not the way it works. Uh, they do that in the movies so that you can see the stuff, but you can't actually see it. It's not, um, most of these gases are invisible. So you can't tell if they're around or, or whatever. You just walk into them and, and they do horrible things to you. So anyway, I'm sitting in this room and minding my own business and all of a sudden I can't breathe. And it's not, um, how do I even describe this? I could take a breath, but it was like none of the oxygen actually got to my lungs. And then my throat started to close off. Like I could feel my throat shrinking up and closing off. And then, so I couldn't, I was gasping. I was like, <clears throat> I couldn't get air. I couldn't make my lungs pull air into, um, into my body. Uh, so that was when I died. And then um, they brought me back a few days later. No, I did not die. Respawn. But it was a little scary. It was more than a little scary. It was like freaking terrifying. Is it kind of like when you get the wind knocked out of you? Uh, a lot like. That's really good. I didn't think about that, but I think that's right. Or breathing in like, dry ice fumes. Breathing in dry ice fumes, it feels like you're taking a breath, but you're only getting like carbon dioxide or something. That, that's right, because uh, carbon monoxide bonds with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. So you're, you're taking a full breath, but you don't get any of the oxygen. The carbon monoxide is taking all the oxygen and binding it up, so you're not getting any. I've never actually breathed helium so I don't know um, what that's like. But um, yeah, it was, yeah, okay. I've heard that it's very much like having an asthma attack, only there's no way to get rid of it. Uh, mustard gas and chlorine gas both work like that. So, but mustard gas is worse because mustard gas, when you breathe it in, it blisters your lungs so that they can't take in any oxygen. I mean, you could breathe if you want, but none of the oxygen can get into your, um, to your bloodstream through your lungs because your lungs have all blistered from the gas. This stuff is horrible. And lest you think the you know, stinking Germans using this gas, the British were using it by the end of 1915 as well. But here's the thing, militarily, how well does this work? I mean, it's extremely well. Kind of. Kind of. So it, it, it can take out a lot of people, but it can go to your side too. So you have to have perfect weather conditions, but in some cases it ends up killing your own men too. It, it does, it's not just one side that's getting hit. It hits everybody and it destroys everything. Plus it lingers. It's heavier than air, so it stays down in the trenches. So if you want to kill a bunch of guys, like think about what it is you're trying to do militarily right killing the other guys is great but there's no point in killing the other guys unless what happens it disperses right because what do you actually want do you want dead people or, or what do you want you want the gap to get through right you want you want land you want to take over the place they are if you destroy the place they are what good is it it doesn't do you any good. Not, not as much, no. So um, in the 1970s, 70s, 70s, 80s, 
um, there was a lot of discussion about nuclear warfare and all of that stuff and how um, that was all going to work. And everybody was pretty sure when I was your age, um, we were, everybody was pretty sure we were all going to die in fire from heaven in a nuclear war, right? So um, there was a particular kind of nuclear bomb called a neutron bomb, okay? A neutron bomb is a heavily irradiative bomb. It doesn't, it, it explodes, but it doesn't do most of its damage with explosion. It does most of its damage with radiation. The idea would be that you would drop the bomb on an enemy city, it would wipe out all the people, but it would leave all the buildings and everything. And everybody's like, this is the perfect weapon, because then all you do is just kill all the bad guys, and you keep, uh, that, but then you keep all the buildings. Here's the problem. They finally got around to computing how long it would take the radiation to go away. And it was something like 470 years or something. Yeah, so, okay, I can blow up your, I can kill all the people in your city, but it's going to be half a millennium before we're gonna be able to go in there and take over. Probably not, and so no one's ever used a neutron bomb in war because it doesn't really work. Um, I mean, it would work, I guess, if the point is to kill all the other guys, but that's never the point. What you want is to take over their stuff, right? Killing all their men, women, children, whatever, is only a way to take over their stuff. Ideally, what you want is for them to just drop their weapons and let you march on through, right? You don't necessarily want to kill them. You don't want to blow up their stuff. And that actually becomes a problem for the Germans when they invade Russia. The Russians figured something out in 1915 that changed the way they fought the war. Has anybody ever heard of scorched earth policy? You should probably write this down. Yeah, you want to surrender, not a massacre. That's really well put. Excellent. Yes. Killing is a side effect of that's that's perfect, Evan. Killing is a side effect of war. You ever played chess? Is the point in chess to take all the other guys' pieces? No. The point in chess is to do what? The more pieces you take inside of chess, the more likely you are to win, and your opponent won't surrender if he still has his queen on the board, no matter what. Okay, Unless but it's not even. You want to take the king. You the want point to is to capture king. the king. That's the point. Thank you, Bex. That's right. The point is to capture the king. If you can capture the king without taking any of their pieces, do you still win? Yeah. Yeah, you do. You still win. Even if you don't capture any of the enemy pieces, if all you do is checkmate the king, you still win. As an aside, should I tell you about the War of 1812? I'm going to tell you about the War of 1812. Okay, so the War of 1812. Uh, this is the United States against the British. What year was the War of 1812 fought? 1812. That's correct. Good job. Just want to make sure. Actually, the biggest battle of the War of 1812 was not fought in 1812, but I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so um, in the War of 1812, some of you will know this. This is one of these things. Homeschoolers know this. Um, one of the biggest events of, war, of the War of 1812 is the burning of Washington, D.C. I don't know whether you knew that that happened. But the British invaded and took over Washington, D.C. and burned it, including the White House, after eating Dolly Madison's dinner. So James Madison is the president. His wife's name is Dolly. And she has made this delicious dinner when the British invaded, sailed right up the Chesapeake, landed their ships, and marched right into Washington, D.C. because there was no army to stop them. So, uh, yeah, everybody's heard about eating um, Dolly Madison's dinner. So the Redcoats march right into the White House, and the dinner is still warm. Dolly Madison's dinner is still warm. 
So they sit down and eat it, and then they burn the White House, which made the dinner even warmer, but whatever. Um, so, ha, ha, ha. Anyway. Uh, so the, um, they burned Washington, D.C., they burned down the White House, and they thought, okay, the, uh, yeah, Dolly Madison actually is like the hero of one of the heroes of, War, of the War of 1812. <laughs> Are you dodging out of the way there, Eliza? I figured out how to manipulate the video so I can pin different people to it. Spotlight them. I'm learning how the software works all the time. Let me get rid of that though. Just for Eliza. Okay, cool. So anyway, so the British figured, Dolly went around, by the way, I have to finish the Dolly Madison story. So Dolly Madison goes around the White House collecting paintings, documents, all kinds of stuff. Everybody else is running for their lives. Dolly's like, no, we're going to want these portraits of George Washington and blah, 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 and all this stuff. So she goes around and collects all the stuff, and then she leaves, but dinner is on the table. So the British come in, and they eat it, and then they burn the White House. So they burn Washington, D.C., and the British are like, great, we won the war. And the Americans are like, what are you talking about? You haven't won anything. And the British are like, but we burned your capital. We're like, we burned the White House. We burned the White House. We win. And the Americans are like, dude, we don't care about the White House. We don't care about Washington, D.C. It's just a place where a bunch of politicians are. And the British are like, but, 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 but we, but, but, uh, we, oh, I guess, okay. Um, so here's the deal. If you sail up the Thames and burn London, you win the war, right? You beat, that. that's it. Like if you burn London, you won. But in America, it, America is not a political country. America is an industrial country. And all of the trade and the manufacturing and all that stuff it wasn't in Washington, DC. It was in Baltimore. That's where the army was, was between the British and Baltimore. So they can burn Washington if they want to. Who cares? Suppose they killed the president. Who cares? We have a vice president. We'll just put him in. We got a whole procedure for this. We don't care. If you sail up the Thames and take the queen prisoner, you win, okay? But that's not how America works. You kill the president, uh, you know, that's sad. We'll have a big funeral. But, you, but I don't care. You didn't do anything to me. I don't do business with the president. I don't care about that guy. So this was really weird for the British. They couldn't figure this out. So that's why the whole Francis Scott Key writing the Star Spangled Banner and all that is outside the Battle of Fort McHenry. Fort McHenry is right next to Baltimore. That's what the Americans cared about was the shipping and manufacturing in Baltimore. No one cared about DC. There's a bunch of government buildings built on a swamp, inhabited by politicians. All they do is get in the way. Things actually worked better once they burned Washington, DC. Anyway, so the US goes on to win the war, um, sort of. We think we want it, they think they want it. But as I was saying, the biggest battle, the most blo the bloodiest battle of the war, sorry, Elizabeth, the bloodiest battle of the war was actually fought two weeks after the peace treaty was signed. Can I switch the screen, please, to what? I'm not actually controlling what's on the screen right now, I don't think. To me? Oh, God, no. I don't want to see me. I don't even like looking at me. No, way too scary. Cancel the spotlight video. Oh, then we get them. All right, so we're leading the class, sort of. Yes, it's true, theoretically, but anyway. So the, actually, the biggest battle of the War of 1812 was fought two weeks after the peace treaty was signed because uh, down in New Orleans, they didn't know that there was peace yet, so they were still fighting. So the Battle of New Orleans is fought a couple weeks after the peace treaty. Anyway, that's the War of 1812. Anyway, so here's the deal um, with the whole gas thing. Killing a bunch of the other guys, it does indeed make it more likely that you will win the war, but it doesn't win the war by itself. And what they discovered is that with this, with this gas stuff that they used, they were killing a lot of their own guys. Their own guys are terrified of it. Like, you send gas shells over, bomb the other guy with gas shells, your troops won't advance 
for a long time. Like they're terrified. So they won't go over there. So you can't actually take their land before the other side can bring reinforcements in with gas masks and occupy the same positions and then you can't get anywhere. It doesn't do any good. So gas is the scariest weapon of World War I, but a long way from the most effective. What is the most effective weapon of World War I? Artillery is super effective and it definitely changes the nature of the war. Not even submarines. Guns, but what kind of guns? Machine guns. Yeah, machine guns. No question about it. The machine gun is by far the most effective weapon of World War I in terms of the number of people killed. But actually, if you're talking about what killed more people than anything else, People. Yeah, no, not really. Yeah, machine guns are still, everybody loves those. Not everybody. What actually killed more people than guns or artillery or gas or submarines or anything else? This is true in pretty much every war, but it was totally true in World War I. Tanks? Nope. nope. Not people. Nope. And not tanks. Nope. I mean, kind of people, but only kind of people. Words. I love that. But no. No. Think about it. I don't know, maybe these are machine guns that could fire again and again and again and again. Machine guns are definitely, they kill a lot of people. But, all right, think about this for a second, okay? So here we are. Um, we're um, in a trench and we're getting ready. Dogs? What? Disease. Was the thing that killed the most people like bombed or like bomber planes? No. It's disease, sickness, it's illness. Disease. It's disease, yes. So you that's get, ironic, isn't it? Now, yeah, okay. we're in a war, and what kills the most people is disease. That's interesting. Always disease and infections. At, right, which I'm I'm sort of lumping those things together. But thanks for the clarification, Rachel. That's exactly right. Okay, but think about it for a second, right? Think think about this. Okay, so you got all your troops packed into really tight areas. Can they wash a lot? No. 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 Um, it's not, I mean, some places it's freezing cold, but a lot of places it's not. I mean, it's only freezing cold in the winter. The rest of the time it's, you know, not warm, but, but warmish. It's warm, it's wet, and there's lots of unwashed bodies there. What does that sound like a factory for? Disease, sickness. As well as most battles were fought on either one side of a river or another side of the river. river. But since they're both on the sides of the river, if they go in to wash, then the enemy's just going to shoot them and kill them. So nobody's washing. Um, where, are, where is everybody pooping? Think about this now. People have to poop, even in war. In the trenches. <laughs> what happens when you poop in the same place you get drinks? That's Dysentery. disgusting. Dysentery. Cholera. No, it's not. Yes, it's disgusting. It's way Okay. But it's even worse than that. So you get 500,000 men. You all come up over the top of your trench. And you're running across the ground. And they're shooting you with machine guns. Is every machine gun shot hitting you in the head? No. No. These guys are not stormtroopers, okay? It's not, you take one shot and down they all go, okay? That's not how this works. These guys are human beings. And human beings are surprisingly difficult to kill. So you fire 10,000 rounds and all thousand of their guys, they're either lying in the, in the field or they've gone back to the trench. Of the guys lying in the field, what percentage of them are dead, actually dead? Statistically, in almost every war, 
this percentage applies. About what percentage do you think? 13, 25, those are good guesses. Keep going a little bit. Sixty forty. It's about one third. So thirty two percent is pretty good. Abby wins. Okay. So uh, about one third. So about two thirds of the guys who came up out of the trenches who are lying in the field, they're not dead. They're just wounded. But they're lying in mud. How long are they going to lie there until there's some kind of a truce to allow everybody to go out and collect their dead and drag them back to the trench? Is it mud though? Is what? it mud? Some of it's mud. Some of it's worse than mud. As well as if you're lying in mud and your own filth, you've got, and you're wounded and you're bleeding out, you've got a lot higher chance to die because um, if you get shot and you're lying there and you're not going to die, your greatest fear is infection and disease. Amen. So. Here's the problem. You're bleeding, even if you're not hurt that bad. Maybe they only just shot off part of your lower leg, but you can't walk on it. So you're lying there in the muck, which is contaminated with all kinds of, of filth and disease and stuff. If they manage to drag you back to the trench, the trench is made of mud and it's wet and gross and disgusting. There's no way to wash you off. They're gonna just bandage you up the best they can and then try to get you to a hospital where they also don't have water because in 1915, they still don't really have nailed down germ theory. If you want, if you really want to thank your lucky stars that you were born when you are, look up, hold on a minute, I gotta put this guy's name in the chat. This is one of my heroes, but his story is so sad. Ignaz Semmelweis is this guy's name. Um, well, they could get, but they could only get enough water for drinking, like canteens. They didn't have enough water to bathe. That's, water's heavy. It's really heavy. Transporting water is hard. A pint is a pound the world around. So if a pint of water weighs one pound, how much does a gallon weigh? Nope, not 16. Wait. No, eight. Eight. Eight pounds. So every gallon of water is eight pounds. Suppose you have a thousand men, and in order for them to have water to bathe in, they need 10 gallons of water each, which is not bathing, that's like wiping yourself off. But let's say it's 10 gallons each. You have 10,000 men. So that's 80 pounds a man times 10,000. That's 800,000 pounds. That's just for 10,000 men to be able to have a sponge bath. Oh yeah, isn't that Semmelweis? Oh my gosh. So he figured out, Semmelweis figured out he didn't figure out germ theory, but he figured out that if you wash your hands in the hospital, fewer people get sick. I know, right? Like, what a radical idea. You know what? No one believed him. Florence Nightingale in the late 1800s figured out that sunlight is a great way to, sunlight and fresh air is a great way to keep people from getting sick in the hospital, but nobody believed her. So in 1915, only some of these techniques are being used. There's no penicillin yet. They don't know how to use that. You get infected, they cut your leg off. That's what happens. We also read a book though, but it said that they'd like do something with their hands bloody, then they go to the next patient without washing their hands. Then the lady said, you guys, it's disgusting. There's germs. And she ended up like saving like before only like 
a very low percentage of the men made it out of the hospitals after they went there. But after she came, like 99% of them actually made it out alive. Huge, huge improvements. But read about the opposition she faced. How many people are like, no, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. I'm not listening to a woman. What does she know? Fellas, don't be guilty of that ever. Okay. Ever. I will know and I will come and find you and it will not be pretty. If you're still alive, which you might not be, because listening to women is a great way to stay alive, starting with mom, but working on from there. This is a public service announcement. Keep your blood on the inside, kittens. Okay, so the, um, yeah, by far the biggest killer in World War I is not bullets or bombs. It's, it's disease. It's infection, disease, filth. That kills way more men. At the end of World War I, you're going to have a thing called the Spanish flu. You want to look this up, but not today, because we're going to talk about that in 1917. But the Spanish flu will kill more people globally than World War I, World War II put together. So, yeah, war is horrible. Spanish influenza or Spanish flu, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Anyway, so um, we got to get to the end of 1915. We're, I, I've got to go and see my family. But um, we got to get to the end of 1915. So toward the end of 1915, the Lusitania has been sunk. Oh, we got to go back to Lusitania for a second. Before the Lusitania sails, and when did the Lusitania sink exactly? I can't remember. Follow my advice. Don't abuse your power, Elizabeth. Please only use your powers for good. Put bacon on it. Well, that helps everything. I mean, duh. Actually, if you put bacon in it, like I like having bacon in it, that's even better. Um, so, all right, so... May 7th, all right, in 1915, the Lusitania is sunk. Before the Lusitania sailed, it had a lot of American passengers, a lot of British passengers, but before it sailed, the Germans, the German government, took out an ad in the Baltimore Sun. And I'm trying to, I wonder if I can find the ad. Give me a second here. You guys can probably look it up just as fast as I can, or faster, given that it's your generation that does stuff like this. German. I think it was the Baltimore Sun. The Germans took out an ad in the Baltimore Sun, I think it's the Baltimore Sun, maybe not. Maybe I'm confusing it with something else, but I think so. Um, essentially telling the Americans not to get on British ships that were carrying arms or ammunition. And America's like, <laughs> you can't tell us what to do. Right. And then the Americans got mad when the Germans sank the ship that they said, by the way, if you get on the ship, you, I mean, you got to be really careful getting on the ship because we're going to, okay. Yeah. Here, here's sort of, this is really hard to read, but this will do, I think. Yeah. Ooh, sneaky. Tell them what you're going to do and then do it anyway. Cause they won't believe you. By the way, that's a dark art. Be careful with that. But it does work. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes not. What are you doing? I'm going to the kitchen to sneak a cookie. Oh, okay, sure. Ha 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 ha. But then you really are. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, it only works a couple times. Okay, so here is the, um, here's the ad. And I, I, think it's, I think it is the Baltimore Sun. But here's a copy of the ad. Um, 
it's not easy to see, but basically it says travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies, that the scene of war, and I can't read the rest of it. My eyes are getting to be too bad. Um, but essentially, the Germans basically tell the Americans, look, if you get on this ship, this is, you have a chance of being killed because we're going to sink it. I mean, we're, and the Lusitania was a passenger ship, but it was absolutely carrying both guns and ammunition. No question about it. So then the Germans sank it, just like they said they would. And the Americans are all furious. At the, well, how can you do that? Maybe it's just Americans that are like this. But uh, yeah, evil. Exactly. That's I what just did a little bit of research. And apparently there was roughly 567 years between the Black Plague and the beginning of World War I. There you go. Fascinating facts. That's a long time to figure out germs. Yeah, and they never did. I mean, they, they finally did, right? But, but when you think about it, okay, think about this for a second. You're a doctor and you go, you get it in your time machine and you go back from the 21st century to 1875, okay? And uh, you get into a hospital and uh, you have no penicillin and you don't have x-ray machines and you don't have any of the stuff that you're used to using. And then you say, you need to wash your hands because there's germs. And they say, really, what are germs? And you say, well, germs are these like really small uh, creatures that live on your hands. And they're like, there's invisible creatures living on my hands and that's what makes people sick? And you say, yes. And they say, that's so interesting. Come with me, there's a couple of gentlemen. They'll put you in a nice room with some padding on the walls and then you can't hurt yourself anymore. Okay, it, imagine trying to explain germ theory to somebody who doesn't have a microscope. So invisible creatures make us sick? Oh, that's very interesting. No, like, well, but, they had microscopes. but seriously, you can kind of understand how that might not be super persuasive. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, um, so try not, try not to blame their idiocy quite, quite so much because undoubtedly right now in the 21st century, there's something like that that we're doing, but we don't know what it is. We think we're so smart. Oh, we think we're so smart. We wouldn't be stupid like those people. That's actually really cool to think about. Yeah. There's any number of things that I'm going to end up being super embarrassed about at some point in my life. Things I believe are totally true now that are going to turn out to be like cartoonishly stupid, but I believe them anyway because I'm stupid. Like that's, yeah. Okay. So anyway, you know, we don't know everything. That's exactly right. All right. So um, they sink the Lusitania, America gets really mad, but America doesn't quite join the war, but they do start a program called Lend-Lease. Somebody tell me what Lend-Lease is. I'm not telling you about the terrorist attack today. Maybe in two weeks when I come up there, maybe we'll talk about it then. But I'm not going to tell you about it today. Yes, okay, I know they had a microscope, but the point is that the microscope's not good enough to show you what germs are. Soviet strength, wow, wow, wow. Somebody tell me about Lend-Lease. It's for providing uh, military support to other countries, I think. 
one second. Which, I, specifically I just, which countries? Um, right. Foreign countries. Are we lend leasing with Germany? No. To any to any country who's vital for the security of the United States. And who did we think was the most vital country for the security of the United States? England. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a convenient way of getting in the war, even though you're not in the war. Land lease was when we were, yeah, just giving food and I think I said oil to other countries. No, it's more them. than that. Giving them food. Guns, powder, ships, military men, money, you anything. You betcha. You <laughs> betcha. Absolutely. The United States was essentially funding the war by leasing military equipment, ships, armored cars, guns, artillery to mostly the British. Because, hey, the British. They had the strongest Navy, which means, and they're, if they're halfway across the sea, then who would they give it to? Would they give it to the French, who probably didn't have the strongest military, no, and no, no, no. the strongest navy, which if Britain has the strongest navy, then Britain can protect them better, because sure, they'll cross the ocean. Right, sure, that's good, absolutely. So um, yeah, the, basically the United States, it was still neutral. And this is technically a policy, like when you read it, it says, um, the, uh, you know, we, we will, with any country deemed vital to American security interests. But seriously, who did we deem vital to our security interests? The British. So we just really loaned all this stuff to the British. The Brits were having trouble manufacturing uh, stuff. They didn't have as big an economy as we did. So we manufactured a bunch of stuff and sent it to them. But they were paying for it. So it's cool. So we're not really in the war. We're, we're just, you know, it's just business. We're just doing business. Yeah, America was taking sides long before it got into the war. Everybody knew the United States was eventually going to come into the war, but, um, but it took a while before it actually happened. So um, by the end of 1915, here's a map. Let's, let me show you a map. It's a map, it's a map, it's a map, it's a map. I know it's, I'm a map. I know that people, I'm modifying it for my own purposes. Okay, okay. So here's a map uh, that basically shows you where we are at the beginning of 1915. I tried to find one for the end of 1915. I didn't do a very good job. I couldn't really come up with one. I had one, but it's at home. So, um, Germany looks like it's doing pretty well. Russia has decided on a scorched earth policy. Somebody tell me what scorched earth policy is. This is like the last thing we need, are going to talk about today. But what is uh, scorched earth policy is when when they come through they burn all the crops and stuff so that the enemy can't use it. Excellent job, Sabrina. Um, that's right. So there's really only one country that can do this because there's really only one country that's so big that they can burn most of it and it still doesn't matter. Russia. There you go. So you're invading Russia. It's getting cold. It's coming on toward winter. You're gonna need to eat. But you're like, that's fine. We'll just push the Russian army back out of their towns and then we'll take the food from the towns, right? Great idea, except what happens? The Russians burn everything. The Russians retreat and they burn it all. They don't care. They can just do that. So they back up and burn it. So when you get there, yes, you took the city. Congratulations. But what's in the city? Nothing. This is what we were talking about earlier, right? If you destroy the stuff that you take over, what good does it do you? Well, the Germans found out that it doesn't do you very much good. Moon song, the elf. 
Oh my gosh, Sabrina, you're a fascinating human being. All of you are fascinating. I can't believe there was ever a time in my, li in my life when I did not know you. Yeah, um, when you're burning, retreating and burning and retreating and burning and retreating and burning, like there's nothing for your enemies to grab onto. Those of you who are thinking about how does this relate to other stuff that I know, and I know you're all thinking about that, there's a time in the Book of Mormon when this happens as well, those of you who know your Book of Mormon history. Yeah, it's also because um, if you're having your groups, they're marching forward, supply lines are falling behind because they have to go through a bunch of mountains, and a lot of what you rely on is supplies stolen from That's it. towns and stuff. So if they're burning it all, the Germans are basically starving, marching straight through at the Russians, and eventually they're all just gonna fall down starving and not gonna be able to move anymore until the supply lines come. Ta-da! Yes, the Germans and the Russians are both starving, but the Germans are starving more. There's a point in the Book of Mormon where the entire Nephite, Lamanite, everybody is under siege. And what they do is they collect all their food, all their grain, all their crops and everything, and they bring them all into the middle of the, of the land inside of this great walled city. All the people, all, all everything, okay? And this is a serious problem for the guys that are attacking them because how do they get food? supply lines which usually the russians would attack yeah. and steal yeah. it yeah you got to spread out one guy and a can of gasoline can stop your trains you don't need a lot of people just pour the can of gasoline on the train tracks and light it on fire man a couple three dudes and a hammer can take out your um your telegraph lines so this is, by the way, kind of advanced military strategy, which it seems to me like Joseph Smith probably would not have known since he didn't really go to school for this. But he describes in the Book of Mormon, I think this is in Helaman, um, a, a really interesting set of circumstances in which the Nephite armies are all, and people are all collected in one place, and the Gadiant robbers are trying to attack them. And they're failing because they have nothing to eat. They have to spread out to raise grain, but if they spread out, then they get picked off the same way that the Germans got picked off when they spread out their supply lines. So the scorched earth policy works really well for Russia in World War I, and they start adopting this along about the middle of 1915, just keeping up a retreat ahead of the Germans, not really engaging them, but drawing the German army farther and farther away from the places where it's easiest for them to get food and, and all of that kind of thing. Oh yeah, history, people are, people are smart, they figure stuff out. So um, the Russians are losing in terms of territory, but the Germans are getting farther and farther spread out using more and more men to control the territory and they're running out of momentum and they're gonna, the winter of 1915 is gonna be one of the harshest winters in the history of man. So every, yeah, this is not working out really well for anybody. And that's where we're at at the end of 1915. We have the, the uh, Germans occupy Belgium and Holland and they've pushed into France, but they can't, haven't gained any ground in uh, most of the year of 1915. We're at a kind of a stalemate. We will introduce new things in 1916 to try to tip the balance. Oh, by the way, Two other things in 1915 that you might want to know about. In 1915, you have the very first air-to-air -air combat kill. A German shot down a French plane in the very first, that's the very first air-to-air -air kill. We'll talk more about military aircraft in World War I uh, in two weeks when we get together. Um, also, you have the very first ground-to-air kill in, in the history of war, really. A Serbian private shot down a, an Austrian plane with a rifle. 
That's a pretty dang good shot. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. Um, we we'll talk more about military aircraft and about the first <laughs> Americans to get involved in the war in two weeks when we get together. Um, I have an announcement about the two weeks. Okay. Yeah, he probably got promoted. Yeah. Um, I have an announcement about the two weeks. You want to write this down. You're going to want to dress warm. You're going to want to dress in clothes that can get dirty. And you're going to want to bring probably a shovel if you have one. Next time we're meeting? Yep. Next week, or next time will be the first of, I think it's the first of November, November 1, I think. Maybe November 2. I can't remember. It's Maybe this evening. November. What? 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 Get the shovels to learn how to dig a trench. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm disclosing nothing. Um, I'm just saying, Mr. D. What? Hearing that information makes me a little what? bit scared and a little excited at the same time. That's the perfect place for you to be in with regard to this class. A little, scared, a little bit excited. That's the perfect spot right there. Well, not not exactly trenches because inside of all fights at the Western Front, it says some people prefer a shovel because a shovel has some weight in it instead of like bayonets because bayonets just spear someone and they can just spear you back as a shovel it can go right through and chop off their head through some back thank you for that now i'm a little less excited and a little more scared that i mean i think i might be out of the sweet spot now after that lovely piece of information can we bring pickaxes can you bring what pickaxes yeah sure that sounds good. Why not? I'll have an I'll have an equipment list for you. Um, when we uh, I'll I'll email that out here uh, next week. Um, okay, so next time, nineteen sixteen. One of the oh my gosh! If you thought it was bad in nineteen fifteen, just wait. Nineteen sixteen is a mess. You love gruesome. I know you love gruesome facts. It's one of the reasons we get along so well. So next time, 1916, I'm going to email out. There's a couple things I want you to research. But next time we get together is November 1st, and we will be together. I'm coming up. Uh, so pray for non-freezing weather and ideally no snow. Uh, but if there's snow and freezing weather, I don't care. I'm coming anyway. And uh we're gonna do what we're gonna do whatever it is we're gonna do geez goose now poor elizabeth we got all the way to the end of class without well that's not true we've been talking about blood all the way through class so never mind um questions for me comments quotations queries humorous stories outbursts of emotion amusing anecdotes no, I'm not. No, Sabrina, come on. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the time Mr. C was involved in a terrorist attack. That's what we're gonna do. Not today. I'm not telling you today, Sabrina. You're just going to have to wait. No, Alex. No. No. Yes, keep your blood on the inside, kittens. Have I not told you that? Okay, I need to be more explicit. Oh my gosh. You will remember to ask me. Remember to ask me. What do you mean there's not much you can do? Just make sure your blood doesn't get on the outside. I mean, I, you know, keep it on the inside. That's where it does all kinds of good. All right, people, I'm going to go eat more bacon and talk to my mother. And you should eat bacon and talk to your mother too. And then we will both have an awesome day. Your uncle got followed by the CA. Sweet. Her side of blessing to get grapes. Yeah. Oh, I should, uh, yeah. Ro also remind me to tell you about the time that my father ended up on a terrorist watch list with a bodyguard in France and how he escaped from his bodyguards. Uh, that's a fun story. I like that one. Did you get him for bacon? Yeah. Okay. See you, Mr. C. That's awesome. What, what, what? 
Yeah. Right. Well, I think you guys are awesome. Thank you for hanging out with me for the last couple hours. Uh, and I hope you have a fantastic day. And I cannot wait to see you in a couple weeks. Farewell. Bye. Farewell. Protego Maxima Fianto Duri. Fake Latin, actually. I'll explain what that means too, but not today. Cool.